So uh, yeah, welcome everybody to the um, event tonight on uh, Parity on Boards, a uh, joint event with YW Boston. Um, I'm just going to kick it off. I'm uh, Kira Gogan, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm here as a moderator for the panel, which we'll be doing after Secretary English's uh, presentation, but I'm going to turn it right over to you, um, Secretary English, if you want to uh, do your thing. Sure. Awesome. Uh, well, you. good evening, everyone. I'm April English, pronouns she, her. I serve as the Chief Secretary of Appointments to uh, Governor Moore Healy. Um, in that role, I oversee the appointments to over 700 plus boards and commissions, as well as thousands of managerial appointments throughout the administration. I'm very fortunate to have um, two diverse teams. Um, one is uh, the boards and commissions team, um, which is uh, has a director, Kate Kelly, and uh, senior deputy director, John Torsha, as well as um, a program manager, Julia Fone. And on my personnel side, I have a uh, director, Tasia Williams, and an employment coordinator, Calista Carter. Um, and additionally fortunate to have teams that are committed to making sure that not only these boardrooms reflect all the communities throughout the Commonwealth, but also within the appointments um, that we're making throughout the administration. So diversity and inclusion and equity is at the forefront of the work that we are doing. I am I formally hail from the Attorney General's office. I am a lawyer by training. I served as an Assistant Attorney General for 19 years. Uh, my first role was in civil litigation, doing consumer protection, protection work for about eight and a half years, then moved into the criminal bureau where I did some prosecution and insurance and unemployment fraud, um, became a division deputy division chief and a director of a unit. Um, and all the while I had served as the chief, as the chair, co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee. And so uh, 2016, 2017, our now governor, former attorney general, put me in the position as the first chief of organization development and diversity slash inclusion at the attorney general's office where I oversaw the hiring. I oversaw the hiring practices and revamped the hiring practices to make sure that we had a more equitable process and that those who typically uh, did not walk in through the doors and get employment would have more opportunities to do so. I focused on um, mentoring, professional development, as well as um, making the office more accessible, more inclusive, welcoming, and belonging for everybody uh, who worked there and anyone who interacted with us throughout the office. Um, so I bring that lens to the work that I'm doing here in the governor's office as the chief secretary. Um, it's important, this administration believes that representation matters and opportunities are essential. And so equity and, and inclusivity are critical to the success of everything we do. And so opening the doors of government to everyone is what we are doing. So in terms of, um, and I don't know if there is a slide up yet. I will do this right now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. So if you can get to my slides, that would be great. Yes, that slide right there. Boom. Go back just one more. I just want people to be able to have the information to be able to contact me. Because another important thing about this administration is we want to make sure we're accessible. Um, and so I want you to be able to have uh, my wonderful my email address, which is listed, um, as well as all the ways for you to look at the numerous boards and commissions that exist throughout the administration, throughout the state, and kind of peruse through them, see what's available right now, see what you might be interested in, um, see where your interests, your passion, your lived experiences, your skill sets, um, your professional experiences, where they align, um, and if there are any opportunities. You can A, apply through the website. Um, we have brought it to uh, current year of 2024. So it's up to date and not as archaic as it once was. 
And so you can actually fill out a whole application um, that me and my team will be able to see. Um, so you should feel comfortable doing that. Obviously, if you have any questions, you can also email me directly and I can either answer them or um, put you with one of my team members who can assist you along the way. Um, but we want to hear from you. We want people to be interested. Um, like I said, there are 700 plus boards and commissions, which means there is a board or a commission for anybody. Um, and we want to dispel this idea, this myth that you have to be some particular individual with such a particular background um, in order to be considered to serve on a board or a commission or a council um, throughout the administration. So um, in terms of, you know, how we focus on things, um, we just, we, we go through the numerous boards um, where there are appointments needed. Um, some boards, you'll see when you go through the list that there are seats that are requirements. So you, you do have to have a particular talent, right? Um, a particular skill, or you may need to um, live in a particular area Right. Um, and so for us, when we're talking about diversity, um, we're talking about race, ethnicity. Um, we're talking about our LGBT plus community. We're talking about our veterans. We're talking about our um, people with disabilities. Um, we're talking about um, geographical inclusion and making sure that we're administration that is hitting all corners of the state um, and bringing people to the table collectively um, and inclusively. Um, and so that's really um, how we start building uh, boards is looking at the makeup, the current makeup of the board and seeing what's missing, right? Seeing where we can fill in some missing pieces of the board. Um, and so we receive obviously applications, we receive emails, um, we do our own outreach to make sure that we are um, getting a full landscape of what can be out there for a particular board or commission. Um, and then of course, making the recommendations to the governor um, and going from there. There's one piece that I always like people to know um, is that if you are being considered for um, a board or a commission um, and you are moving forward in the process, we do background checks. And so there, everyone goes through a background check. Um, even people who feel as if they don't need to go through a background check, go through a background check. Um, and that is important so that um, we get the full landscape of who people are um, and that there's nothing that could embarrass you or that could embarrass the governor or the administration. I try to tell people that um, it is, uh, we're, we're looking to protect the governor and the administration, but we're also looking to protect you because um, we don't want your life on display as well. So there is a background check that everyone um, fills out. I filled one out to get my job. Um, so everyone goes through the background check process. Um, we always ask for a resume because um, that's how we can um, uh, kind of review all that you have and then some. Um, and then the cover letter obviously sells you as well. Um, especially your passions and interests, right? So a resume doesn't just do it for us because that's kind of where you worked, what you do, what you've done, but we want to also know who you are as an individual. That's important for us. Um, so if you reach out to me, you should feel free to share um, your resume. If you want to share a cover letter, you want to share a bit of who you are, that's perfectly fine. Um, and I will make sure that someone reaches out to you and has a conversation with you um, about your interest. And if you apply and you're like, I don't know if my application has been received or if anyone has looked at it, feel free to reach out also and just ask, you know, I submitted a resume, just want to make sure an application, I'm sorry, and just make sure you received it. That's fine. Please don't ever feel like you're a bother. I want to be accessible to everybody and make sure that you're able to reach the people that you need to reach with any inquiries that you have. So that's all I have. Are people allowed Fantastic. to ask questions in the chat? I think, yeah, all? we have a QA and a that if people want to have any questions, they can okay. ask. Okay. Um, I know you don't have a ton of time, um, but I actually, I actually have a question that popped into Please. my head while we're waiting, mm -hmm. if anybody has any Q&A. Um, 
you mentioned obviously you know background checks and you know protecting us protecting the governor um if if there's a change in leadership within the commonwealth which yeah. obviously happens from time to yeah. time hopefully not yeah. for a long time yet yes um <laughs> do, do the boards turn over as well or is that or are they not mm-hmm. like that yeah. closely connected um most um boards have terms so and here, here's uh the interesting um interesting piece of it is that um the term doesn't follow the person, the person follows the term. So say someone resigns in the middle of their term and I put you in, you will fill out that term and then need to be reappointed at the end of that term. You wouldn't get the full four years of that term until you were reappointed, then you would have the four years. Um, But most of the boards and commissions have a term. Some um, are at the pleasure of the governor. So yes, um, a governor could come in and wipe out um, a whole board um, and shift it if it's at the pleasure. Um, so that that can happen. But um, typically there, there are terms. Um, and so we follow the terms. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. I see one question in the Q&A. Let me open it first, please. Yeah, it just says, um, could it, the team please yeah. post any links in the chat? We can yeah, do that. Yeah, I'll leave that up to yep. YW team. We've got to take it care of. <laughs> All right. Um, if there are any questions after I leave uh, for me, please feel free, YW, um, to send them to me, and I'm happy to answer them. Um, or you can send um, individuals um, my email address as well. You can put that in the chat as well. Thank you kindly, everyone. Fantastic. I apologize that I have to run. But I'm Thank glad you so much. we're having this conversation and I know your panel is going to be amazing because they are amazing people, every single one of them. So enjoy the rest of the evening. Take care. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to uh, transition to the panel. Um, we have obviously three panelists here with us. Um, I'm just, just the moderator, just asking the questions. Um, so I think we're going to, instead of doing a formal like readout of everybody's bio, we're going to do a little um, introductions, ask each person to introduce themselves um, and let us know like one or two things that they would like you all to know about them. And we're going to start with Kirsten Alexander. Hey, everybody. Thank you. Um, I am the vice chair of the Essex County Commission on the Status of Women, which is my first statewide uh, commissioner board, but I am also the, I was the elected town clerk in the small town of Wenham on the North Shore, um, and now I'm the appointed clerk. And uh, right now I've been swearing people in all week, so it's been um, a lot of fun and and I can share a little bit about the local appointment process as well. Um, but I have been on board since I was 15 years old and i um, it's, I think if you really are looking for a, an honest network of people that you really get to know well, volunteering alongside them over many months of working on projects together is really the best way to go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Craig next, if you would introduce yourself and a couple of things you would like us to know about you. Hello, 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 everyone. I'm Craig Aarons Martin, uh, Lee Boston, class of 2022. Uh, So excited for all of those uh, from the Lee Boston community and YW. Uh, Super, super uh, excited to be in company with you. Uh, I am a CEO of CCM Education Group. So I have an education firm that works on uh, co-creating some bold solutions uh, that will have young people and uh, the adults who are standing in the gap with them thrive. Um, in some of my capacity out, uh, outside of my full-time work as an education consultant, I'm also the co-chair for the Massachusetts uh, Commission for LGBTQ Youth, uh, which is the only independent state agency across this nation that uh, that does incredible advocacy work, education work, empowerment work uh, on behalf of all of our young people across the Commonwealth, but especially our queer and trans community. Um, I also serve on a couple of other boards as well, um, where I have uh, served in many different capacities, and I'll, you know, I'll share more about that uh, down the line. But I'm excited and delighted to be with you all. 
Fantastic. Thank you. And thank you for the work that you do, both of you, all, all of you. Um, uh, but specifically part, as part of the LGBTQ plus community myself, I think having that, you know, some somebody in, in, your, in your corner, especially when you're young, is like so important. So thank you for that. Um, Keisha, you're up. Good evening, everyone. My name is Keisha Bryce, and I am the chair of the very first Cannabis Social Equity Advisory Board for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, although I've served on many boards before, this is my first um, state board appointment, um, and I'm looking forward um, to continuing our um progress that we've been making. And I think one thing I'd like to share with all of you is that I'm here today because I am extremely passionate about being a change agent. And one way to do that is by being involved on a board and encouraging you all to um, consider being involved on a board as well. Thank you, fantastic. Um, so that actually kind of leads nicely into our first question. Um, Anyway, which is after learning about boards and commissions, um, I'm sort of curious as to why did you join one? I mean, obviously, I think there's a, a decent time commitment. Um, and, you know, you mentioned that you're like passionate about being a cha change agent. So what what sort of led you to joining like boards right. and commissions being the way that you, um, I guess, the way that you, you know, you advocate and you're in, in that change agency that you want to do? Sure. And I'll start. Um, so this most recent board appointment, my reason for wanting to join this board is specifically because I wanted to be present and involved on an issue that hits extremely close to home, not only for me, but for other individuals, families, and communities that are similar to that of where I come from, which is urban Dorchester, the upper corner area, born and raised here in Massachusetts. Um, and particularly for the Cannabis Social Equity Advisory Board, the intent of that board is to kind of shine light and provide support for communities that have been historically marginalized by the war on drugs. So for me, it's number one, a personal fulfillment, um, but also a way to literally be the change I want to see. Yeah, no, that's great. I appreciate that. Um, same question to, um, I'm going to go the opposite way I went before. So to Craig, um, you know, again, you know, I'm sure that there's a huge time commitment or maybe I shouldn't say huge. I don't know what the time commitment is, but you know, there's, there's a time commitment to boards. Obviously we're all busy. Um, what made you want to sort of bring board life into your life? Uh, well, I actually share uh, the same sentiment as Keisha, uh, and I'm going to make the leap that maybe Kirsten also feels the same way. When you feel passionate and you want to have a small sense of impact on, you know, the community, uh, small or great, you know, just depends on um, on what is the surgence, uh, insurgence of ideas, energy that surrounds a particular thing. And for me, when I look at, you know, being a, a Black queer man in, in this America, um, I recognize that there, uh, in the K-12 space, there are young people who are looking for someone like me, uh, who may share some sense of identity, may share some sense of passion, and uh, may find me as a light. And, and so, it is not just my duty to be an educator who is in the classroom or in the school building with them, but it also means that I have to shout to the hills and cause all kinds of ruckus in the day to day, whether or not it's, you know, doing testimony before uh, the state or the city or, you know, a school committee. But it's also how I show up and walk and talk in this work and in this way. Someone did it for me. I didn't, I may not have even known their names, but they set the deck and they set the play, uh, platform for me to actually be here today and be alive. To be Black and queer and male in this America at this time is a unique, you know, ball because there are so many moments in my life where maybe I wouldn't have been here uh, and maybe I wouldn't be talking to you today. But so uh, there was enough people who cared enough about me and about my well-being without even knowing my name that did that work to set the stage. So I'm here. I carry the baton. And then the goal is actually to um, bring other folks 
who carry similar energy, similar fervor, who have a lot of fight in them so that I can go ahead and step into the next thing I'm supposed to do as part of my destiny, but that we also have folks who are just as fired up about some of the issues that we have and make sure that they're in the room to make the decisions. And so I think that my decision to join anyone's board or commission is because I, have a, a, I am mission aligned and driven to what they're sharing. I'm on fire about it. Um, that I want to be active in the work that I'm doing. And I know that it's about something greater than I. This was, you know, when I'm joining, it's not about me anymore. It's about the young people or the entities who are going to be best be served by my service. Awesome. Yeah, I think sometimes there's a notion of like, oh, to look at my resume or whatever, but it's like, it's not, it's not about that. It's about service, right? It's about how can I, how can I better, how, yeah, step into, creating space for people like me coming up or, um, you know, or, or just making things better for me, even as I am, as, a, as a, you know, in the state that we're in. So, yeah, I hear you. Thank you. Um, Kirsten, I think you're, you know, you said you joined your first board when you were 15. So I'm going to sort of, you know, pivot the question a little bit, like at 15 years old, what, you know, what encouraged you, what was the impetus for that for you? Hmm. Um, I had a great teacher, you know, I, I was the statewide, the Massachusetts Junior Classical League. I was the historian the first year and the president my senior year in high school. Um, it brought me to high schools across the state and my teacher drove me to, you know, way out in Western Mass, out to um, Lynn High School, I mean, just all over the place. and. And actually, it kind of ties back to the Essex County Commission on Status of Women and why I joined, because it is regional. And, you know, I think we can all end up in our bubbles. And for me, volunteering on any board is a way to meet people outside of my regular sphere um, and that, who are inspiring, too. You know, so that the issues that I see in Wenham, I can see, are those the same issues that are happening in Gloucester? or in North Andover, or are they different and how? And how does our town play into a broader uh, picture? And we're seeing that with things like the MBTA laws um, around zoning, which, and we had a, a speaker at one of our recent meetings about that, because I saw like, what is going on across the region and how do we hear back from people and, and also part of our role is to identify women who would be great on boards. You know, and, and I see up close who, that there is a lack of gender parity on, on the boards in our town. Some boards are almost all women, like the Cultural Council. And then some boards are either all men or maybe there's one woman like our FinCom um, addressing finance. So why does that happen and, and how can we make um, changes around that. So um, it's been an incredible experience being part of this group. Um, very, very inspiring. And, and also just being able to listen to young people and women across the region in listening sessions. Um, it's, it's really um, motivating for me. And, and working with women has been a, a lot of what I've done for most of my volunteer career. Great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I think there's an ecosystem with that. Like at what you were talking about with the boards and like certain boards are more women. That, it's like that in the corporate world too, though, right? Like certain departments are more, you know, HR, marketing, you know, certain departments are much more skewed um, female and others are much more skewed male. Anyway. Um, so the next question I had was, you know, obviously we're taught, we've all talked about, you know, diversity, I think on boards in some way, shape or form or, or in the ecosystem in April, you know, Secretary English mentioned it again, and you all bring different backgrounds and perspectives to the boards that you're on and the groups that you're part of. Do you have a, an example of a time where you had like your unique view or your perspective from your sort of vantage or your growing up or whatever it might be really made a difference? Um, and I'll, Craig, can I pop to you first on that one? Sure. Could you say a little bit more about uh, just the frame of the question? I want to make sure I answer you. Uh... Yeah, I think the, the question is like, where had like on the boards that you've been on or mm -hmm. or even even circumstances that you've been in, but this is supposed to be about boards specifically, but 
where do you think, have you seen a time like where your unique perspective, I mean, certainly as a, as a gay queer man living in this time, a black gay queer man living in this time, where that perspective or any of those, those identities sort of had a, has a, had a difference, made a positive impact on the work of okay. the board? Thank you for, uh, for clarifying. Uh, Certainly. So, I mean, uh, I, I think that there's some statistics out there that say that uh, when when it comes to uh, leadership positions on uh, some of the state boards, we find that um, women and people of color account for like what fifty percent uh, in regards to uh, whip women um, and people of color at twenty eight percent, and then. If you think about uh, the intersection of sexuality or, or, um, or uh, sexual orientation, um, queer and trans folks find themselves probably in the single digits in regards to their representation on boards. And, and so how do we continue to uh, have, you know, really courageous conversations about the intention of making sure different voices are at the table, our indigenous brothers and sisters, our uh, immigrant vo uh, perspective, um, you know, a queer trans and, and, and the list goes on. And, you know, also making sure that folks feel comfortable in being on the board and not being the only one. I've been uh, the token. I've been the only one uh, and that cro that checks off all of these different lists, right? I, okay, we needed someone who's queer and a person of color. And you look around and you're like one of 15 people and you recognize that boards uh, may not have the, um, have not had the strategy. I'm going to be assets driven today <laughs> conversation. The impetus to make sure that we have really intentional um, strategies and campaigns that bring not just one, not just two, but making sure that there's a, a you know, a, a shared experience that everyone believes that that variety um, of folks and perspectives are there. For me, um, in my role as an executive director and head of school, it has always been my impetus to make sure that young people see representations of themselves uh, at, in, in the classroom, in leadership, at the table, as well as knowing that if we don't have that voice present, how do we go about going out and bringing those people in? And I have to understand, well, what will make you feel a sense of belonging and connection to our organization? You might feel compelled by my mission. You may uh, feel compelled by the strategies and goals we set, but if you don't feel comfortable with the people who are espousing such values that can be pr uh, troubling especially if they don't show up in a way that's supposed to be representative of the mission and goals of an organization the ethos of an organization and so what i have come to learn to do is try to not bring just me we got to bring a few. So how can I bring me and a friend? Let me introduce you to the board leader or to uh, the board leadership and say, hey, yes, I appreciate you, you know, considering me. How about these other folks who might be uh, even more interesting uh, than me, maybe even more compelling than I, because I, I think that it is about um, it is also part of my duty to make sure I'm not the only one in the room. So what I've tried to do is uh, be disruptive in that way. Uh, bring other folks to the conversation, uh, invite those people to come with me at a different event where I'm serving at the board so that people can start to get familiarity with them. And sometimes it takes seven times for someone to be like, oh, you're that person who was with, oh, and they're willing to have that conversation. So that's some of my thoughts. No, I appreciate that. I, You know, what's interesting when you were talking about this sort of tokenism of like being the only, I've always thought about it in, in this way and you just changed my mind. But I've always thought about it as like if 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 you have you might be the only or I might be the only, but if we have a voice, then that's not tokenism. And I still think that's sort of true. But I think what you said is like, yeah, but you're still alone in that, right? And you're even if you have a voice, you didn't say this exactly, but this is I'm I'm sort of extrapolating my thoughts with what you were saying. Like even if you have a voice, you're still the only person. So you're you're still going to feel that isolation potentially. And so, mm -hmm. and then you also feel that responsibility to bring others like you along and into the room um, in a way. So I think that I, re I appreciate that because that's actually shifted something for me. And I, I'm always, I always love to learn something. So yeah. And, and, I'll just, and, and I'll just add just this last little note. It, it's hard for someone to have carry the responsibility of then representing all of these voices because you happen to have this one identity or two identities. And then everyone is looking to you on, well, what do you think queer and trans folks are going to say, Craig? 
Well, I don't, I'm not all queer and all trans. I don't know what every perspective is or what is it to be a transplant from another town and city or, and coming to Massachusetts? Yes, I've been here for 20 years, but it doesn't mean that I know every aspect of the Massachusetts experience. So just knowing that uh, there's, uh, there's a need for us to make sure that there's more people who may carry diversity and whatever that means. And knowing that even within that, even within two people who share a sense of identity, that their experiences may be much richer and different from uh, what we may anticipate. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, Keisha, I think you, I feel like you had wanted to jump in and had something to add to this or to ask, answer that same question from, you know, perspective of like, you know, the diversity on boards, you know, having diversity on boards being important. Um, why and what have, what have, what experiences have you had where that your your presence has had a positive impact sure for me i've had a lot of aha moments with regards to um my experience serving on boards and i think primarily because i'm coming from the world of legal and compliance and regulatory so i'm bringing that background with me where i'm interpreting rules and regulations i'm interpreting the risk that comes with those rules and regulations. And I'm also looking at how certain rules and regulations could be biased and or discriminatory um, towards a certain group of people or a certain type of company or um, any situation that they may be. So a lot of times when I'm in a board, I'm always saying, well, yes, this may be good for this cause, but how is this going to negatively impact the other demographics of people that we aren't thinking about? Um, and then everyone's like, ah, oh, well, we actually did not think about that. So let's go back to the drawing and figure out kind of how can we phrase this or what should we be thinking about um, before we implement or initiate or recommend something and it has a negative impact on the overall decision making or the overall leadership responsible for promoting that particular um, change or, or recommendation as a whole. Um, I've also been similar to Craig, the only one in the room, either the only woman, the only person of color, or the youngest on a um, a board um, where the majority of individuals on the board have been um, in their positions within the, you know, that organization or, or status for 10 plus years and I'm the newbie. So I'm challenging the old ideas and thinking about the new ways of doing things. And often I think um, because you're the one in the room that looks different, that acts different or that's perceived differently, you're also the one that's most frequently challenged because people aren't understanding your perspective and where you're coming from because they haven't thought about it. Um, so for me, um, diversity stems from not only race and socioeconomic demographics, but it also, it's important to have um, diversity and experience um, because my experience as a black woman could be very different from the experience of another black woman. Um, or from that of a black man, obviously, as well. So um, I think that it's very important when looking at the diversity on the board or looking at boards that may be of importance or interest to you to not only think about what you can contribute to it, but also what you can take away from it. It should be two-sided. I love that. Yeah, thank you. Thank um, you. I have another question for you, but I'm going to go to Kirsten because I have to ask her this question. And then, um, and also I just want to mention too, for, for the folks um, on, on the other side of this, uh, please, if you have any questions, pop them in the Q and a um, we're going to have, I think a lot of time for questions after this, so we can certainly do that. Um, but I just, you know, might as well start kind of putting them in there now, if you have anything. Um, Kirsten, same thing for you. I think, you know, tell us about a time when your unique view or your unique perspective made a difference and also what your thoughts are about diversity on boards and why it's important. I'm going to start with the second part first. Um, I, before being a town clerk, I was a consultant and one of my clients was Harvard Business School. And I got to go to an event where one of the professors, uh, Frances Frey, talked about her research on corporate boards and diversity on them. And she found that, yes, one person, totally a token, 
two people of a different look or background or or whatever it was, um, still tokens, the third person was what changed it. Because it wasn't like, oh, we're going to ask the woman. Okay, woman, tell us what women think. You know, Now it's three people. You have more diverse opinions amongst those three people and everyone else, and it starts to be just part of the norm. And I, so I think that that is the goal. And I, I love, Craig, what you said about bringing people along. I've heard about math, women in mathematics who say, I'm not going to be on your panel unless I'm not the only woman. And I think that's genius. You know, just like, just insist on it. You know, if you have that privilege to say, yeah, no, you don't get me unless there's like at least two other women here or two other people that are not old white men, for example, uh, which is the predominant uh, vision of what a mathematician would be in that case. Um, for me, I um, I think one of the perspectives that's been really helpful for me is I'm currently on the Boston Desegregation and Busing Initiative. I was one of the kids on the bus the first year of desegregation. My brother, who uh, was adopted and three months younger than me, is Black, and um, I'm white, and we grew up like this transracial twin set um, desegregating every space we walked into. And so I always knew we were treated differently in different spaces. I knew that I had certain privileges. Um, and I think we both became kind of bridge people who understood a broader world. And that's been incredibly helpful to me on many boards and um, on the desegregation and busing initiative. I'm one of the few kids on the bus. Most of the people who really care passionately about desegregation were adults at the time. And the 25 years ago, when there were some commemorative things, I was the only kid on the bus in the room and people were so angry still. And for the last two plus years, we've been planning and talking and it's been absolutely incredible to be a part of that. Um, even though I was only five, you know, when it happened. But then I was in the schools and most of the rest of them were not. So that, that's been very meaningful for me. Yeah. I mean, you bring <laughs> such a unique perspective then to that conversation that they just don't, they don't have, they haven't had the experience. They weren't part of it. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, Keisha, the, the question that I had for you, it's actually not about boards. Well, it kind of is, I suppose, but I'm just I'm just going to indulge myself for a second. But you mentioned that you're on the, the Cannabis Commission because of um, the stigma around the war on drugs and how that stigmatized the Black community. Um, has the legalization of cannabis in Massachusetts destigmatized that at all? Has it changed anything, do you think? No, because I still think there is a disconnect in terms of the education and the historical component of the wear on drugs and the cannabis industry itself. I also think that the cannabis industry came to light um, because of there's a whole bunch of rich white men who were able to make billions off of it. And then again, it's kind of, and I will say this too little too late, where it's like, okay, now we realized we took something that has negatively impacted communities and families of color um, for generations to come and mm -hmm. we've legalized it and we've allowed more Caucasian white men to become million and billionaires off of this product. And now we realize, oh, by the way, we forgot about the people who this historically has negatively impacted. So let's go back and revisit how we can band-aid and patch things up a little bit. And is that the work of that commission, that sort of band-aid and patching? So I think that the commission is doing lots of great work. And I think that the Cannabis Social Equity Advisory Board of Massachusetts is a huge step considering um, the evolution of the industry itself. And number one, it was an extremely um, premature 
um, industry that um, I like to use the analogy of building and flying the plane at the same time when it comes to understanding cannabis um, in general and the historical component of it, um, but also the legalization component of it, cannabis still is not federally legalized. We are just now in the talks of federally descheduling it. Um, and states are still in the process of pardoning, um, you know, people who have been negatively impacted um, by um, crimes that are associated with cannabis in general. So there's a lot to go, um, not just at the Massachusetts level, but at the state and, and federal level in general. But I think that the work that we are doing at the CSEAB um, has been um, um, evolutionary. And there, there's more work to be done, but then the one year that um, we have been involved, we've identified loopholes. And I think that part of being on a board is one, identifying those loopholes, but two, identifying solutions to solve and resolve and prevent other states who aren't there yet to look at Massachusetts as a model for, hey, this is what they've done. This is what they've discovered this is what they've changed, we should follow them and turn it up a notch. So it's okay, okay to be the blueprint. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I was, there was just a curiosity that I had when you started talking. So sure. Just, no worries. We had a few minutes. <laughs> um, the last question that I have on our little list of questions is actually, it might be a it might be a twofold question. I mentioned earlier, um, Craig, you were talking about the, you know, the passion and everything. And I said, you know, some people might think of this as a sort of a resume builder, but obviously it's a lot of work and time commitment. I keep saying that it's a lot of time commitment. I actually want to ask, I guess, what is the time commitment? I guess it's different for different boards, but um, like, why should somebody think about other than all the reasons you've already stated, um, think about joining a public board or commission? And um, is there anything else that you wanted to add about what you found rewarding about it? Um, and I think I'm going to start, Kirsten, with you. Yes. <laughs> I have thoughts again. All right. So I, one of the things I've, I've learned um, in all kinds of boards and also informal groups is that if you really want to make change, you need to do it with a small group of people. And um, trying to do that change by yourself, it's just not going to happen. So you need to find other people who are like-minded and willing to put in some time because if you are doing it all by yourself, you're just gonna burn out, right? So, but if you can spread the work around a little bit and be inspired by each other, it really keeps you motivated and you get things done. It might take 20 years, but you will see change. Um, I have seen incredible change since um, when I grew up in Boston, um, when I was a young woman in. Upham's Corner, um, living in a three-decker, and my state rep was Marty Walsh, who came to our our um, neighborhood association meetings every month, and I, to see him become mayor and then secretary of labor after you know hanging out at uh, St. Mary's Women and Infant Center for our, our meetings, it's it's kind of mind blowing, but also to see the change that we made together in our own neighborhood, which was pretty rough at the time, um, but also thinking about how to keep people there um, who wanted to stay and, and those equity issues, which I don't think we succeeded at in the end. Um, I'm going to ask a quick follow on though, how, like you said, you know, obviously change takes time and I guess intellectually, I know that, but I'm not always a patient person. How do you, how do you keep motivated for 20 years trying to make a change? And I, I mean, I guess maybe it's a stupid question because maybe the answer is, well, if you care that much about it, you will. But I, I, I personally find myself getting um, disillusioned um, when things take a really long time. Uh, maybe that's naivete. I don't know, but how do you, how do you keep yourself motivated over time like that? Everything takes longer than you think it's going to take until it goes and changes overnight. So, um, you know, I think about things like marriage quality, which I worked on and, um, was so exciting when it, it finally happened. Um, I think about helping to elect the first Asian person to Boston City Council, the first woman senator 
in Massachusetts history is Elizabeth Warren, which is a little shocking. Um, growing up, our Boston City Council was incredibly racist, sexist, everything is. Um, so to see Boston change that much in my lifetime, I'm really proud of it and have been a part of it. Um, and also to bring that spirit out to the suburbs too, um, where it's important. And I've always taken the tack of, and I walk into an organization and it is like the whitest room I've ever been in and going, do I quit or do I change it from within? And um, I've in most cases chosen to, to change it from within and it and they have changed. So I, I think if you can stick it out, it's really valuable to the world. That's amazing, thank you. Um, Craig, I think I'm coming to you next, same question. So, so why should somebody think about joining a public board or commission or, you know, you've already you've talked a little bit obviously already about what you find rewarding about it but is there anything else that you want to add to that or um you know with sort of what Kirsten was just saying about the the time the time that change takes like how you know how do you stick with that i think it's part of your why uh it, you it has to be core to you it has to cause you to wake up in the middle of the night um, and say like no more absolutely not on my watch you know if I'm a quote Ian Levan's out for a moment um what we have seen over the last five years and longer right is Roe versus Wade being overturned right and, and, and you saw that all of a sudden reproductive justice efforts like there was a sense of security that this this uh you know law in the books or you know was going to preserve women's rights and then when it was struck down by the supreme court what it then did was not only set back uh, you know entire movements by incredible women but now it redefines someone's why because now you're talking about bo bodily autonomy we could say the same thing about you know gender affirming care for uh queer and trans youth uh, and we're seeing all of these laws being architected uh, and designed and enshrined so that it can make people's lives harder. It can actually, it's harmful and fatal. And, you know, it, it, and it it's tough then to say, well, why would I actually put myself in, in position to be on a board where I don't even know if my vote is going to matter? And so that has definitely disenfranchised many people of color. But what I can say is, if not now, then when? I think Audre Lorde is the one who said... Um, you don't have to be me in order for us to fight alongside each other. I don't have to be you to recognize that our wars are the same, right? And so what I think about with this uh, quote um, and what I think about the spirit of this is if you're not in a room, then you leave it up to other people to define your destiny. And so if you want to make change, then it starts with getting in the room. Then it means bringing other folks along. It means that you now have to shift the narrative around how people are seen and viewed and the impact. You have to bring the research uh, to the folks, even your lived experience, and make sure your voice, as well as the other narratives of other people, are brought into the conversation so it's not just singularly about you, but it's about the collective. It's something greater than I. So as I started, this is bigger than me. At this point in my wonderful age, I understand that my fight is for the next generation who's looking at me and like, where were you? What did you say? I can search the social network right now and see that you didn't say anything that mattered to me and knowing that this is what I'm inheriting. So I have to go and be on boards and be in places and spaces where I might not have the energy, may not have the time, but I have the passion and fire to do so. And that I also know that if I start to help enshrine policies, laws, regulations that have to be abided by, there has to be ordinances of certain percentages of people who are represented who are making decisions financially as well as from a policy perspective that we that's the board you want to be on you can start small if you want but i'm like get on the boards where people are making decisions about government contracts housing ordinances segregation zoning like you need to be in the room and we just saw that you, we have april english a wo black woman of color in such a pivotal, she's saying we're looking for folks. So why not 
put yourself out there. Your lived experience is your license. It's your certification. It is your permission to be in the rooms and help make the decisions that will shift the destiny of people who may not even know your name, but will know that they've benefited because you put all of you on the line. And I think that's why I keep doing it. And that's what I would encourage other folks uh, to be considering as well. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I think even, you know, at that point about like, they may not even know your name, they might not even know you, there was a fight, you know, like they might just be like, hey, what does I have rights, right? I mean, I feel like I think about that, the Roe v. Wade decision that you referenced earlier was, it was just over, just, just over two years ago that that was, that was reversed. And there were people, you know, I mean, I'm 56 years old, right? So like I, you know, it technically existed in a time, I actually grew up in Ireland. So it was, it was very much a time where there was no um, access to, to reproductive health care. But like most of the people impacted by that ruling have never lived in a time where it didn't exist. And so I think about that and I think about what you just said about, you know, they may never know my name. They may never know. They may never know that there had to be a fight. But you're still going to know and and history will know that that fight happened and that that uh, that a, a, a collective of people, you know, kind of dug their heels in and fought for for us, which is amazing. So thank you. Um, Keisha, same question. Uh, you know, well, I guess a series of questions. Why should somebody think about joining a board or commission and what have you found rewarding about it on top of what you've already said? I think and how do you keep going? I think. Sure. I think Kirsten and Craig touched on um, many of the things that I would have said. And there's no doubt that, you know, serving on a board can be a career shaping opportunity and it can help you hone in on leadership skills. But I think that the part of serving on a board that is not often talked about is the educational opportunity and the abundance of knowledge that comes with serving on a board. And for me, that's particularly important in this day and age where we have the media, social media, and journalism playing a huge impact on intentionally sharing misinformation or encouraging misinformation in order to guide um, the vote and or support of a particular topic or issue. And by serving on a board, you are literally behind the scenes, closer to the issue, getting official insight that is allowing you to be a part of the strategy, to be an influencer, to be a change agent, but it's also giving you the opportunity to take that information and share it within the circle of individuals that you work with, that what's in your family, and hopefully that's encouraging them or um, you know motivating them to want to be involved either on a board or in other ways that may be impactful or helpful in helping to um, impact the rules, regulations, and laws that are or can potentially impact their lives, but the lives of their family and the lives of generations to come. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that's a great point, that educational opportunity that you're learning from each other. And, and they're learning from you, right? Others, you know, whoever, everybody's learning from each other on the board, which is awesome. Um, we had a question in the chat um, that Adriana was um, kind enough to put in my face <laughs> so I can see it right here. Um, is there something that you know about being a part of a board or commission now that you wish you knew when you first started your experience? Um, anybody want to take that? And we'll pass it around to everybody. Unless it's a listed in the uh, kind of qualifications or requirements, there, you're, it's never too early or too late to start. That's one thing that I would share with everyone. There were so many times where I thought about serving on a board and I had uh, people in my ear saying, oh, well, you're too young for that. Or, you know, you won't get selected because of your age. Um, and that wasn't the case. Awesome answer. Thank you. Kirsten, Craig, either one of you have? Okay. Kirsten. Yeah. Um, I would okay. say take the time to learn the rules. So the Massachusetts Junior Classical League um, taught me Robert's Rules of Order. Um, and I 
I've been on a bunch of bylaws committees and I have to say, read the bylaws, know the bylaws, because if you want to, um, whoever knows the rules the most is probably gonna control that board, right? You know, and when decisions get made that are not proper, but you know the rules, you can push back and say, uh -uh -uh. like, no, 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 we have bylaws that is not following bylaws, you know, and they're there for a reason. Um, it's not always fun or comfortable to be on a board. I think that would be the other thing I would say, especially when you are not agreeing with everyone. Um, it can be really uncomfortable, but I have been on boards where I feel like the things I said planted a seed that that sprouted maybe five or 10 years later. And um, maybe no one else was ready to do that thing yet, but it kind of nudged us onto the path. So I would say, don't be afraid to bring your whole self to. Fantastic, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Craig, anything on your side? What you wish you'd known when you started? Yeah, the things that I, I would add, I, I, I agree with both of my colleagues here. Um, I say, I, I would say, listen more than you speak. Uh, so listen to perspectives, listen to the language, listen to the flow of things. You'll learn a lot. Um, and I think that that's very important. Um, I also think about uh, building bridges and not walls. So figuring out what, you know, where are you able to build uh, really great relationships uh, with allies and um, possible mentors who are going to be with you on the board. And just know that part of this, even if you have a divergent perspective, that you can find a commonality in the passion of whatever is the work. So uh, I, I think about that. And the last thing that I, I think about, and I, it has been something I'm continuing to do, uh, is uh, not being afraid to ask questions, getting curious, it, be annoying <laughs> and be okay with it because you don't know what you don't know. And it's good to ask questions of, well, why are we doing this now in this way? Are there other ways we've explored getting at the same end? Because it's very possible that no one has thought about that as a question. They've just done it because that's the way it's always been done. There's still great ways to get to the to the end, whatever that is, uh, by starting with curiosity and embracing that as a vehicle for change as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the attendees? And I also um, invite, I suppose, any of you have any questions for each other or Aaron or Ad Adriana, if you have any questions um, for the panel as well. I mean, we're, you know, we have a little bit more time, I think. So um, just curious if anybody else has any questions. I have one that, so one of the things I think about it with the work and, you know, particularly you can get pretty burnt out. You know, if you, most people on boards are giving people, they're not doing it for their own reward. They're doing it to get back and, and move things forward. But um, is there a time where you felt like, okay, I can't do it right now. And I'm going to pass the baton to someone else. Cause I feel like it is a relay race. It's not, you know, a marathon for one person. So I don't know. I want to talk about that a little bit. Oh. I I just I just dropped my you know well oh, okay assets right asset space okay so I've <laughs> okay all right uh so I've just uh resigned from a couple of boards um and one one I think both are both are designed and on their way to doing some really good or great things um but I had to make a decision on whether or not my service to that committee was valued and regarded as well as whether or not I felt like there was forward momentum in regards to the mission and strategy. Um, and there are th there's elements that felt very core to me in regards to why I felt compelled to join that no longer are. And so I feel like my service and time was time well spent and there will be other people who will join and will add something different that I cannot because my time is uh, over. And so I also will name there are going to be times where you're going to just say, hey, you know what? This no longer serves me. It may not, uh, and it may not even be serving the organization in a way that I can. And so that's where you have to do a deeper dive to say, well, do I want to, is this one of those strategies where I bring someone else on who's just as fired up about this and maybe they want to join it? Or maybe you just say, 
you know what? I don't even want to hurt my friend or my colleague's feelings and uh, invite them to some chaos that they may or may not necessarily want to navigate. And so that also means that you have to be very clear in why you are making a decision to transition. And so I'll just say I have, and I'm on a number of boards and love board service, but I also understand when my time is done because what I came to bring to it is over. I'm okay with saying, say la vie. Um, Keisha, did you have anything to add to that? Or it's fine if you don't. I just Craig took all the words right out of all my right. mouth. Okay. <laughs> I guess the only thing I will add is that serving on a board is another job. So when you think about work life balance, <laughs> um, it's important to take into consideration um one, the original intent behind you joining the board and whether or not you can continue to pour into it and whether or not it's continuing to pour into you. We want pouring, not draining. So once mm -hmm. it becomes a drain, then you need to re-examine whether or not you should continue on. Okay. Something that popped into my head when you were all talking, um, and maybe this is not, I don't know, well, I'm going to ask the question because I know I felt it in other situations, but have you felt like in the context of a board that you've had to sort of defend your existence in any way? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Craig's sake. Yes, that's why I'm not on those boards anymore. <laughs> Sorry, putting words in your mouth, but yeah, it's so nodding. I mean, we don't need to extrapolate on that. I, if you don't want to, I just was curious because I feel like it's probably like as, you know, as yeah, there's going to be times when those things happen, right? Yeah. Well, I think the one thing I will say um, on that topic is be prepared to fight fights that you did not think would be an issue or a topic um, while committing to a board. Um, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Fair. All right. Um, there was another question in the chat, although I think that question might have been for Secretary English, but I don't know. You you all may have answers to this, too, is how long is the board nomination process? Like, pro I, I'm assuming that means, like, after you apply, like, do you, how long has it taken for you to get accepted to board? So I know Kirsten definitely has answers. Yes, I knew you would. Well, I, I just want to say, you know, it, it totally varies by the board, but um, it, you, you want to figure out what the cycle is for for being appointed. So for example, in the Essex County Commission on the Status of Women, um, I was like, what is this thing? I think I'll apply. It was like some random thing in the middle of the night. I, was, I had insomnia, I think. And um, so I apply and nothing, like crickets for maybe a year. And it's because it was not in the regular cycle. And then all of a sudden, hey, we're so glad you applied. We have an opening. Would you like to be interviewed for it? And I did. And, you know, a couple months later, I was on it. So I would say anything in government is probably going to be slower than you might imagine, and certainly more than a nonprofit or a corporate board. Um, and there's a lot more process involved. You know, everyone on a government board has to do ethics training with the state. Um, you have to get sworn in. Um, you know, there's just some hoops to jump through. And the conflict of interest is really, really important for um, you know acknowledging that you might have one and recusing yourself and really understanding open meeting law. So it's like next level, way next level beyond Robert's Rules of Order. So, um, but really rewarding to, to learn those. So I, I do think starting on a smaller public board is good to start to learn how that process works and then and then start applying to more complicated or statewide things, um, just so you kind of get your sea legs. Great. And I think you you mentioned, you've said the word volunteering a couple of times, Kirsten. I think it's probably worth saying that like public boards and commissions are not generally paid positions. Um, yes. Nonprofit boards are also not generally paid positions. The only paid boards are typically corporate boards, and those are also much, I, I wouldn't say more difficult to get on, but it's a whole different thing, so. 
Right. And nonprofit boards, you're typically also expected to donate at a substantial right. level. Um, or if fundraise to that level, right? Right. Yeah. Give, get, yeah. or get off. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Having been a development director, that's sort of the, the thought. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank but that should that. not prevent people from joining boards. I mean, right. the give, get, or get off level might be very low on some boards, or they might see you as a really valuable asset because of what you bring that's not just financial. And then there's someone on there who's a billionaire who you know, is funding the yeah. organization. They can make up for, they can make exactly. up for you. Yeah. Exactly. So you can give awesome. a lot of time too, and that's super valuable. Okay, awesome. But in government, you're not expected to do any fundraising. I like that. Um, anything on that sort of length of the process from um, Keisha or Craig? No. Okay. Uh, we have another question that popped up. Um, how do you build trust and collaboration with your fellow board or commission members throughout the process? Maybe Keisha, I'll start with you if you have an answer to that. Oh, um, so I, for example, with the CSCAB, I took it up, that's the Cannabis Social Advisory Board. I took it upon myself to reach out to all of my fellow board members independently and just say, can we have a call? I want to introduce myself. I want to, you know, know your thoughts. How can we be supportive of each other, you know, and so forth. But obviously you have to be very careful about the context of the conversation because you don't want to violate open meeting law. You can't really talk about what you aim to do or want to discuss regarding the board and its intent in general, but you can talk about passion, um, motivation, and most of the time you get the gist of um, kind of impressions of what someone's real intent is behind their involvement um, and participation on the board. But I think that having that initial um, um, interaction, it's kind of like when you're the new, the new employee at a company and you want to reach out to your colleagues to introduce yourselves and see how you guys can uh, work best together. So I would say take that same approach. And then over time, you'll know. And the intent of serving on a board, don't go and think that everyone's going to agree with you or everyone's going to be aligned because that's just not going to be the case. Um, but it's an opportunity to learn from each other, even with the opposing viewpoints and perspectives. And it doesn't mean that you have to bump heads and be enemies while participating on the board with someone that has an opposing viewpoint of yours. Thank you. Um, Craig, what about you building trust with your I, fellow board members? I always think that you're dancing or dating your your fellow board uh, commission folks. Uh, I, Lil Beyonce uh, River Dance is in my spirit uh, from this morning. So I'm just thinking about that. And I just, you know, I, for me, it's about, I'm always thinking about, well, who in the room is speaking? How are they being received? So I think about the diverse voices of those people who are in the room. I also think about, well, how are we holding ourselves accountable to the norms and, and ethos of our organization? How do we how do we do that? And I'm taking my cues from other folks uh, in the room and space. And then I get curious and ask some folks like, hey, I'm just trying to understand, you know, how this vote played out or why is it that there's such a staunch you know energy around this issue or this person who may be a barrier to whatever we're trying to accomplish um and then thinking about well what are the ways you can network very much what what uh, Keisha spoke about how do you build out like a, a a 15 minute coffee or a conversation to get to know who that person is why are they committed to uh the organization in the way that they are and what are they what what is keeping them there? What is keeping them there? And I, I think that that's also uh, just as a key to this is I'm not only here, but I'm still serving and choosing to continue to serve. And I want to understand why it is that you have given years of this to this organization or, or to this ent entity. And then I lastly think about 
little way what are the ways i can be empowered and feel empowered to leverage my voice as well as be empowered by the collaborations and conversations that are happening with other people so say i really appreciated what you said here and this thing right here while i don't agree it did push my thinking and let you know i would love to you know explore a little bit more with you on that that lets the next person know that they were heard that you may not agree but you do value their their humanity and are willing to you know get clearer on how they you know arrive at their position or stance which i think helps to build trust in relationships great thank you um and i mean those are life lessons anyway right <laughs> Like all of those things. It's, and the same with, with what you had said, Keisha, like just, you know, just getting to know people and sort of hearing them and paying attention and um, showing interest, which is awesome. It's great. Um, Kirsten, anything from you that's different? Yeah, I would add, you know, having just had, what, four years now of Zoom meetings, that meeting in person is incredible incredibly powerful, especially very early in the process. And I love what Keisha was saying about getting together with co for coffee. And I think the most effective board president was the nonprofit board I worked with took or had lunch with each one of the new board members that she didn't really know. And that gave me a lot of trust going into the process where I could tell there were weird undercurrents going on. I was new to this board. A lot of them had been on it before. And I was like, I don't know what's going on here, but I trust her. And so I'm voting there, you know, and it, it was, it was really smart politically and in, in her, um, in that case. Um, the other thing that I really miss about in-person meetings, and this is a little different with nonprofit versus public boards is the meeting after the meeting is like the most important meeting you know, just driving somebody home or hanging around outside going like, what was that all about? You know, or it's, or even just calling a friend and saying, well, what do you think was, what went on there? Or what did I miss? Or you learn a lot that way. I always try to drive people home from meetings. Um, now with open meeting law, again, you, you can't do that, but um, in the nonprofit world or corporate world, you certainly can. Um, so yeah, like getting to know people outside of that world and, and as Craig was saying, you know, just you you can totally disagree with someone and still be friends with them. And that's a really important skill that not many people even think is important these days. You know, we're so polarized that if you can find common ground with someone, you know, maybe you're Red Sox fans or something, you know, you there's other things you can talk about that makes them more human it's gonna feel a lot better for you too when you're disagreeing about something because you know them as a human being. Fantastic, thank you all. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat and I didn't know if, I know when I asked you if I had any questions for each other, Kirsten, you had a question, but I didn't know if Craig or Keisha, if you had any questions for each other. And if not, is there anything that we didn't ask you or you didn't get asked today that you wanted to share or you wanted to sort of get out um, as part of this conversation? Sure, Kirsten, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to put out that the legislature is and has been considering for the last several years parity on public boards legislation. Um, and as the Essex County Commission on the Status of Women, this is one of our priority pieces of legislation and I love being able to work with other women on that, but it's not just about women. Um, it's LGBTQ, it is uh, racial, cultural diversity, and um, it has been stuck for years. So, you know, everyone out there and in this room, uh, Zoom room, you have legislators, you can talk with them. You can say, I would like to see more people in the room when the decisions are made that look like me or have my background or represent the people I love. So that's what they're there for. Give them a call. Yeah, is there a um is there any sort of an online like we can go and click a you know click a thing and write to our legislators kind of thing on that, Kristen? Um yeah, so I probably there is, but you can go to the legislature and see the actual bills and mm -hmm. you know who proposed it what the iterations have been over time, um, see, you know, possibly see if your legislators voted on it. I don't think it's 
gotten to that point. Um, and then uh, Mass Commission on the Status of Women has an advocacy day every May. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, if there's any, yeah. Do as well. So. Okay. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Um, Craig, anything that you wanted to add that you didn't get to say or didn't get asked or anything that you want to share? Anything else? I would say don't, you know, I'm probably speaking more to myself than I am to anyone else. You are enough. I, I need you to just embrace that in your spirit, that you are enough. You're smart enough. Your lived experience is the driver for why you should serve on any board you desire. It may mean you getting in front of folks and making sure that they get to know you. Um, and you may feel like, oh, they're so-and-so and they're thus and so. And I'm like, I'm just Craig, Aaron's Martin, regular Joe. But the thing that I, I believe has made way for me is because I'm willing to go into spaces, have conversations, get to know people as Craig, not because of any other thing. And I don't, I just don't want people to lose sight that your voice and your perspective is important it should ignite you to say i'm willing to put my name in there and see what happens and know that guess what there are other folks who probably felt the same way and then once you got in the room there was a welcoming that may hopefully will make you feel like okay i did make the right decision and if you didn't reach out to us because we'll go ahead and light a fire to somebody uh you know and and, and make sure that you feel welcome because I think we count ourselves out. We get scared by here's all the requirements. These are all the things. Oh, that's the governor's. Uh, I, I don't know if I could do that. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Regular everyday folks are changing the game all the time. So that would be my advice. Thank you. I like that. I like that just you are enough. Like anyway, right? Yeah. Hopefully that's that's another life, <laughs> another life mantra. Um. Keisha, anything from you that you wanted to say that you didn't get to say or anything else that you wanted to share? Everyone has been spot on. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, this has been like just a very enlightening um, and fun, con fun conversation too, which is always important to me anyway. Um, I think we're okay to close early here i mean we've we've covered it all everybody's asked all their questions and we've answered them well you've all answered them i've just been here chatting um um so yeah i'm gonna just i guess i'm gonna just let everybody go and uh thank you so much for your time for your thoughts for your sharing and your willingness to to sort of be here and have this conversation because i think uh it's an important one and um i for one like i said appreciate it and learned a lot so and I know everybody else did too. So thank you. And have a great night. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Go forth and Bye. apply. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody. Night. Bye.